I hope everyone can see my screen and I'm going to put that in a presentation mode. Okay, um, just um, a quick uh, thanks to um, to the team and um, I, I'm, I think I feel privileged to be in company of um, one of a very eminent um, pediatric endocrinologist from Pakistan, Dr. Jam Jamal Raza, who we, I can, I think, call him the father of peds endocrine in Pakistan. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so in the next 10 minutes, I'll just um, breeze through um, one of the important topics that is very near and dear to our hearts, and that is um, um, the um, subclinical hypothyroidism, and again, how to deal with it, how to deal with the scenario of uh, this clinical situation. I will call my presentation as a W talk. And again, I'll try to tell you what my W means. Actually, today we're going to talk in the next five to 10 minutes when, what, who, where, why, and wait. Again, so without further ado, let's start with when and when to look for the disease. And again, I personally think it's an interesting disease in itself. The reason is um, we've heard from very eminent speakers in the past regarding the thyroid and um, uh, regarding thyroid and pregnancy and thyroid and fertility. Pretty much you can find a justification for screening anyone that you would want to if there is a suspicion of it. And on top of it, every organization that you see has a somewhat of a different um, um, recommendation. So you can start with an age of 35 for screening till the age of 60 plus um, by American Academy of Family Physician. Um, I strongly believe that if you have one endocrine disorder, you have more likely to develop other endocrine disorders. So if you have thyroid, if you have diabetes or one of the endocrine disorders, you can justify screening these individuals for thyroid disorders. So the next, next W would be what? And the question is, what is subclinical hypothyroidism? Um, rose with any other name will still be a rose. And I think um, you can call it mild hypothyroidism, early thyroid failure, preclinical hypothyroidism, or decreased thyroid reserve. My personal favorite is early thyroid failure because somehow it you, you can convince or actually um, convey to your patients that you have some disorder of thyroid, but it's early enough you don't need treatment or you need treatment versus an award because subclinical actually sometime is not subclinical and you have clinical symptoms to support it. So again, I usually use the term early thyroid failure for, for explaining, but again, you can call this by any other roles. So what is that clinical? Obviously, we I'm talking in the company of um, endocrinologist physician. It's a TSH, which is slightly high with a normal free T4. The biggest question is, is subclinical a subclinical? Is, is a clinical diagnosis? This is actually a clinical diagnosis, which requires a biochemical um, and evidence. Does symptom reflect the disease or um, disease reflect the symptoms? The easiest is that people who have all the symptoms in the world of thyroid disease, they don't have thyroid disease. And again, sometimes people come completely asymptomatic and you check their levels and they turn out to have thyroid disease. And the reason this is, is true is that if I go around this um, esteem audience in going, how many of you have uh, at least two or three of these symptoms or who does not have any of these um, um, uh, um, two or three symptoms among all which is lit, um, listed like fatigue, muscle cramp, weight gain, hair loss, dry skin, cold intolerance, constipation, mood changes in women, uh, menstrual irregularities, pretty much everyone in this um, uh, audience will have at least two or three of these symptoms. So the symptoms actually sometimes are very misleading and that's why I find thyroid disease sometimes the most challenging one because you treat someone, they become you thyroid, but the symptoms don't get better and they keep coming back to you for the complaints. So the next in the W line is who and who is at risk. And I thought it was, um, very important to know that the people who have risk factors for developing thyroid disease are a number of them. Again, as I mentioned, if you have one endocrine disorder, you're more likely to develop um, the other. If your TSH is obviously more than 2.5, if you have positive thyroid antibodies, if you have a family history, being a woman, um, is it puts you at a higher risk of developing thyroid disease as compared to a man. Um, so there's certain genetic predisposition, goiter, older age, and obviously antibodies that I talked about. The next in W line is where, where to look for subclinical hypothyroidism. So is it, a, is it a disease of our region or is it a disease of Western world? Is it a disease of both the places? One interesting factor which I um, we found um, found out during my literature research, and I thought it 
that people who are um, iodine def living in iodine deficient area probably will have a higher incidence of having thyroid abnormalities and functions. But actually, it's not proven by the um, um, scientific data that we have. Um, the role of iodine is somewhat controversial because people who are living in an iodine sufficient world uh, in the Western world, they have somewhat of a higher incidence of subclinical hypothyroidism. Is it because of the screening? Is it by looking at the blood testing? I'm not sure, but the iodine deficiency or insufficiency does not lead to um, these issues. Um, digging some of the local data, according to one study, the prevalence of this subclinical hypothyroidism in Pakistan was about 4 to 4.1. Uh, actually 5.4% and predominantly in females. I looked at some of the earlier prevalence studies in, in, um, in India, which showed um, female dominance of about 11.4% versus 6.2% in men having a subclinical hypothyroidism or early thyroid failure with an um, uh, incidence of about 94 collectively. If you look at the global picture, if you look at the Western world, looking at Brazil, it's about 8%. If you look at USA, it's anywhere from three to 8%. So the numbers of early thyroid failure looking whenever you screen for them actually come out to be somewhat similar in, in this part of the world as well as the other parts of the world. I found this article very interesting. Um, Hari Kumar published this article a few years back and looking at the people with the vitiligo. And I'm just talking about a certain group of people having experiencing this. Um, it came out to be about 30% of the people with the vitiligo had in subclinical hypothyroid. And if you combine overt with the um, uh, subclinical, about 40% of them had some kind of thyroid disorder. If you were just looking at the people with vitiligo. Um, Dr. Jamal Raza mentioned universal screening for the children. Um, we, there's one, there are not many studies done in children that I could come up with, but one study showed up to um, a prevalence of about 8.43% which seems to be a little higher than what you will see in the Western world. And this was a smaller study, so I cannot vouch for it. But again, waiting for Dr. Jamal Raza to come up with the data, it will be very interesting to see how many new newborn, number one, and how many school uh, going children have this thyroid disorder, which again can have implication when they grow up. So the next line in W is why to treat. So the reason that you would want to treat or not treat or know about this, um, this disease process is that number one, you need to know the, the disease itself in the earlier phase. And you need to know that about 60% of them might have a complete resolution of symptoms and they might revert back to a TSH, which is lower, or they might remain in the range that they were diagnosed with. And that's why um, one of the presentation which I heard earlier, we heard was the local normal data uh, is also very important. But the other important thing is you cannot just look at one TSH, which is high with a normal free T4 and ignore it. Because these individuals, if you look at them, um, probably will end up having um, hypothyroidism anywhere from two to 5%, which is important. An annual rate of conversion from subclinical to clinical uh, overt um, hypothyroidism is estimated about 4% in women with raised TSH and positive antibodies and two to 4% only if the TSH is raised and one to 3% if the antibodies are positive. So these, these women and men do convert into hypothyroid even if the numbers are not looking that bad. And that's when we talk about the management of it, we will discuss about it. Um, obviously, TSH of more than 10 have significant cardiovascular um, risk associated with it. And I'll try to briefly go because in the interest of time, I'll be quick. I'll, let me show you what is more likely related to it and what is less likely to be related. Um, coronary artery disease is related to heart, um, modest increase in coronary heart disease and mortality. But it is more documented in a younger population as compared to 65%. So you need to be aware of that. Increased rate of fetal um, miscarriages, fetal death, and obviously cognitive defects, but it is less likely if you treat them, you can significantly reduce it. There is some data to improve some improvement. So you might see some uh, fetal and neonatal outcomes, but again, this is not as robust as there. The polycystic metabolic disorders are associated with subclinical and metabolic syndrome is associated with pelas, uh, metabolic syndrome. Verbal memory, 
as compared to um, and, and Alzheimer's, especially in women, is somehow related to uh, the subclinical um, uh, hypothyroidism, something that you need to be aware of. There is some data on mental dysfunction related to the working memory associated with subclinical as well. Um, modest increase in weight is related to, which is clinically very significant, but again, subclinical effects on bone are there, but it is not very well established. Um, interesting factor is the increase in the hemoglobin in iron deficiency and hypothyroidism. It is noted that if you don't treat hypothyroidism, these women or men will tend to get the anemia levels back um, slowly as compared to if you treat both of them at the same time. There are some studies showing bile duct stone relation to subclinical hypothyroidism. And obviously there is some evidence of unprovoked DVT associated with uh, subclinical hypothyroidism. And I, in, in the interest, you can see, I have summarized all the studies which are out there. So it's some interesting fact, and I didn't want to leave the conversation without um, mentioning about the TSH and, um, and the subclinical hypothyroidism. The interesting um, fact that I found out was the people who have goiter and thyroid cancer, and if the TSH is slightly up as compared to being in the normal range, they have higher chances of having a metastatic or an advanced thyroid disease. I'm probably related to decreased thyroid function because of the invasive nature of the uh, cancer. We still don't know. But in something, if you find a TSH, which is slightly high in a thyroid cancer, probably you're looking at a more advanced stage and their data to support that. Finally, weight, don't be in haste because the problem is that if you with the um, RB overdiagnosis and overtreating, and again, it's a very interesting fact that since we found out about the um, TSH and whatnot, we recommended the TSH, everyone jumped the van, um, bandwagon and again started treating a um, high TSH. So the number of people who were treated for TSH, which was less than 10, um, jumped up by 30% just after the uh, guideline said that you need to look at the early thyroid failure is concerned. What does that lead to? more people with suppressed TSH, more people with um, a possible risk of converting into cardiovascular diseases. So there is some consensus. And again, I'll run this slide in two seconds. And that is, if your TSH is less than 2.5, leave them alone. If it's less than four, monitor it annually. If it's between four and 10, you can treat them only if there is a very high family clinical suspicion. They are highly symptomatic or pregnancy, if they want to get pregnant, if the women get to and this was discussed earlier, so I'm not going to spend time. If TSH is more than 10, probably you would want to treat in most of the cases, except if they're older, if they have a history of atrial fibrillation, or if they have ischemic heart disease. So if you, um, in the last two slides, I'm going to go over is the other side of the coin, which is a subclinical hyperthyroidism. And again, as um, Sanjay gave me a task of finishing, not only on time, I'll just show you two slides. And this, I will highlight it as we go along. So if you look at the subclinical hyperthyroidism in which the TSH is suppressed, but the free T4 is normal, there are a number of um, disadvantages, which is cognitive, qualitative, um, um, uh, quality of life effect, um, atrial fibrillation, so number of diseases. But what if your TSH is between 0.1 and 0.4? There is only cl good clinical um, uh, evidence on atrial fibrillation and increased bone turnover. The rest of them is still very early to detect. But if your TSH is less than 0 0.1, there's a good quality of uh, evidence on atrial fibrillation, heart failure, increased bone fracture, uh, increased bone turnover, uh, conversion into overt hypertension, um, hypothyroidism, and obviously reduced bone mineral density. But the interesting part, if you look on the other side, who would you want to treat if the TSH is 0.1 to 0.4 versus completely suppressed? There's very little evidence that in a subclinical hyperthyroidism, there is evidence if you have heart failure or bone turnover, that's the only two time when you can really aggressively think of treating them if the TSH is less than 0 0.1. So hence, what we're supposed to do, um, without confusing uh, anyone, if your TSH is less than 0 0.1, probably if you are more than 65, you would want to treat. If you're less than 65 and no symptoms, probably you can wait out and see if you need to treat. But if you have hyperthyroidism, if you have symptoms, if you have bone disease, if you're postmenopausal, you can definitely consider treating. 
But if your TSH is between 0.1 to 0.5, you can consider thinking um, treatment, but you can definitely wait out and see if you need that treatment or not. So some wise recommendation, as I would say, and again, um, Sanjay quoted me this example, so I'm just going to revert back and give you the same. So if you're coming late, your wife decides which tool to use in an appropriate way. So if you're just late, this is the treatment. If you're coming late and drunk, this is the, and if you, God forbid, had a lipstick, this is the device that she'll be using. As endocrinologists, I think we have to use it wisely too. And please listen to, um, them, especially for the general patient, because the problem is when you're trying to diagnose something with too many tests, it becomes confusing. TSH is more than enough in most of the cases if you're screening for thyroid disease. And the use of ultrasound and the thyroid scan are reserved only for if you're further investigation. I usually on a tertiary center see a TSH which is high with an ultrasound, with a thyroid scan, with a T4, with an antibodies, everything come together and patient has spent already thousands of rupees on investigation when they just needed the TSH. With that, I would want to leave this um, image in, in the minds of most of the people that thyroid disease is not something which is new to our world. This is a picture that I took when I was visiting Texela. I looked at the faces and again, I looked at them. Um, I honestly, well, the first thing, first clinical diagnosis which came to my mind with the puffy eyes and some swelling, I thought maybe that the, even at that time, the thyroid disease was not only undiagnosed, but was very much prevalent. With that, I thank you all for your attention.